You are listening to the original Torah Pearls with Nehemia Gordon, Keith Johnson, and Jonah Vandor. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's ministry, McCor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com. Good day to everybody listening wherever you are around the world and thank you for your company. Joining me this hour is Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. Keith, of course, is the author of His Hallowed Name Revealed Again and also available as the 12-episode DVD series entitled His Hallowed Name and Keith is co-author with Nehemia Gordon of the book A Prayer to Our Father, the Hebrew Origins of the Lord's Prayer. Now, Nehemia Gordon, author of the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus, all of which, including the Hebrew Yeshua versus the Greek Jesus live teaching DVD are available from Truth to You. Dot all gentlemen, welcome back to Pearls from the Torah portion. Good day, John. Uh, good day, John. It's wonderful <laughs> I to have speak you. Speak Australian. Both. Yes, you've been practicing. That's good. I like That's that. My third language: Hebrew, English, and Australian. <laughs> and Aussie. Yeah. And Aussie, this yeah. uh, this week we are in Bereshit twenty five verse nineteen to twenty eight verse nine, the genealogy of Isaac, and this of course also has the uh, the story of Esau and Jacob. There is a lot. There's a lot in here. Yeah, there is. Really, really is. Let me kick off with the uh, the opening verse. This is the genealogy of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac was forty years old when he took Rebka, his wife, Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, and uh, so on and so forth. He was 40 years old. Just curiously, how old do you reckon? I mean, we don't know. Um, do we know? Well, there's actually a rabbinical tradition that tells us that Rebecca was uh, three years old when he married her. And uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty messed up. That's all I can say. Um, that's a little bit I mean, first of all, it obviously doesn't fit the context of, of the actual story because, you know, they're asking her, do you want to go? And, and it doesn't even make sense that you'd ask a three-year-old. Obviously, she was an adult that could make adult decisions. Uh, we don't know exactly how old she was. Was, but she may have been considerably aged because she was having trouble giving birth. Mm -hmm. So she may be, have been advanced in years, and that's why they needed this miracle in prayer in order for her to give birth. Yeah, right. Okay, so well, I mean, he pleaded, Isaac, verse 21, pleaded with Yehovah for his wife because she was barren, and so on and so forth. Three years old, you've shocked me with that. I had absolutely no idea. Yeah, that's that's the rabbinical tradition. And that's just one opinion. There's actually a debate about that in the, in the Talmud. Okay. I mean, I can't see a three-year-old carrying a pitcher of water. Anyhow, um, all right. Me, me neither. Maybe it's a really small pitcher. <laughs> Maybe it is. Or really, really small midget camels. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. If all is well, why am I like this, she said. And, and, and we're, we're in verse 24. So she went to inquire of Jehovah, and Jehovah said to her, two nations are in your womb. Now, the first question I have, and uh, Keith, maybe you have an idea on this. There's two nations. obviously. One of them, we're talking about the nation of Israel. What is the other nation? You're speaking of Esau, correct? Speaking of Esau. Mm -hmm. Well, before, you know, you know, I have to do that before we get there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sort of. <laughs> the classic Keith, of course. <laughs> you, you, I have to do that. And the reason I have to do that is I was reading this and that something jumped off the page for me as I was reading it. And it says uh, um, that J Isaac was 40 years old. And then he says he prays to Yehovah on behalf of his wife. Now, we don't know when he did that. Maybe it was a first year, second year, third year. Whenever that was, it says that when the time came for her to give birth, speaking of the first one to come out, well, in verse 7, it says Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth. So what I thought was interesting is at some point after he gets married, they find out that she's barren. So, again, who knows how long that was. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what her age is, Isaac was 40 when he took her as a wife. He was 60 when she finally had the children. That's 20 years. And the reason that jumped off the page for me is it says he prayed. Now, he could have prayed in the 41st year. He could have prayed in the 42nd year. Mm -hmm. He could have prayed three years after they were married. It took until he was 60 to have the child. And sometimes, you know, I, I know that, that, that at least for some of the people that are listening, you know, we pray a prayer and we're like, okay, where's the answer? Where's the answer? Literally, potentially 20 years before she has these children. And that didn't change God's faithfulness, that his timing is perfect. Mm. But literally, 20 years before she has these children, and you know, sometimes, at least over in our part of the world, maybe different in Australia and over in Israel, but we're in a very instant society. You know, microwave, push the button, call, make a phone call. And, and the father, in his wisdom, has timing as a part of, uh, of you know, who he is, and, and his timing is perfect. And so I just thought that was interesting that it was 20 years between the time he married her and the time she had the children. Mm. And we read that so quickly, you're like, yeah, he prayed she had the babies, of course. No, 20 years. So I, I think that's just, that was encouragement for me, that it's not always simple, it's not always quick, it's not always mm. fast. 
but that doesn't mean it's not going to happen. And it's, a, a, it's a, a, a great relief to me that she was at least 23 when she gave birth. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> well, yeah. yeah. Another little pearl here that, I, that jumped off the page for me was where it says, and she went to seek Yehovah. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean? She went to seek Yehovah. Where did she go? And did she go to a prophet? Did she go out into the field like, like Isaac had been doing, you know, when she first came uh, speaking to God in the field? So maybe she went out into the field and, and sought Yehovah, and then she gets this answer where he actually mm-hmm. speaks to her. What a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. And, and again, this is where we are. This is what he says to her. Two <clears throat> nations are in your womb. Now, obviously, uh, through Jacob, we have Israel, uh, mm-hmm. Esau. Who, who is the nation of Esau today? So, well, that's an interesting question. That's a great um, question. That's a great question. Torah pro. Well, so it's really interesting <laughs> because you have these three related nations. You have Israel, Ishmael, and Edom. Edom mm-hmm. is the descendants, descendants of Esau, of Esau. And in Hebrew, it's called Esau. So uh, who is Edom and who is Ishmael? And the answer is we really don't know, but I can tell you what Jewish tradition says, or maybe I shouldn't because you might not like it. Um, and, well, I, no. and I don't know if this is true. I, I, I could just share what, what it says, though. Should I not? Yeah, sure. Maybe, because because maybe the reason why I ask is there's, I know there's yeah. a lot of speculation about that. Verse 30 right. says, And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that uh, same red stew, for I'm very weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom, is what I've got in the... Uh, in the right, Edom is Jones. Edom in Hebrew. Okay. Edom in Hebrew, which means red. And uh, what happened to the nation of Edom and what happened to the nation of Ishmael, of Ishmael? So what Jewish tradition says, and and this isn't like presented as an opinion, it's spoken about as fact, is that Ishmael uh, is the Arabs and and then by extension the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I I don't, you know, that's not a secret. I mean, that's pretty well known, I think. Uh, Mm -hmm. They certainly claim claim to be Ishmaelites. And then Edom would then be the Christians. And, And how do they get from Edom to the Christians? Well... The Hebrew word Edom sounds very much like Rome, and the Dalit and Resh are very often written, or they're written in, in a way that's almost identical. And, and what happened is when Jews wanted to talk about Christianity, the Roman Empire, and, and later the Roman Catholic Church, they referred to it as Edom. And you can actually see some of that, if I'm not mistaken. I think that, that you already find like hints of that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, that they're referring to the, that's before Christianity, mm-hmm. that they're referring to the Romans as Edom, and that's simply because Edom sounds like Rome. And it's out, written almost identically in Hebrew, Roman Edom. That is, that so is now, news now, to me. Now, yeah. yeah. Now, does that mean that, you know, that the Christians are Edomites? That's not what I'm saying, you know, but you asked, you know, or you didn't ask, but I offered, you know, who did Jews traditionally and historically identify as Edom, Edom, and the Ishmaelites? Uh, the answer is the Muslims and the Christians. Mm-hmm. Keith, have you so, heard that before? I've, that, that's, that's one I've, I've never heard before. Are you aware of that one? No, but I mean, I guess, I don't, you know, I guess I would like to do some uh, further research on that. That's, um, that's definitely, that's food for thought, isn't it? But uh, now. <laughs> and, and it also relates to the fact that obviously from a Jewish perspective, the, um, you know, you have uh, the Edomites and the Ishmaelites who are these kind of cousin nations. Mm-hmm. They're like us, but then they're different. Mm-hmm. And that's how Jews have historically seen the Muslims and the Christians. Sure. That, you know, because both Muslims and Christians claim at least that they believe in the Torah of Moses, you know, but then um, in practice, they don't actually observe it. They sure. observe various other things. Sure. Um, cer- certainly historically, that's what's, you know, by and large been the case. Mm-hmm. And so from the Jewish perspective, it's something similar to us, but it's still different. And mm-hmm. I think that's where they get this identification of, and maybe, not, and maybe they didn't mean it literally, um, that the Muslims are Ishmael and, and the Christians are Edom, but symbolically at the very least. And you'll find in, in numerous Jewish sources, ancient Jewish sources, some of them 2,000 years old, they'll talk about Edom and they mean the Roman Empire and then later the, the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. That is fascinating. Wow. That is fascinating. And your opinion on this, Nehemiah, this is a tradition? Oh, true? it's a tradition. So I don't know. I have great doubts about those identifications. Let me put it that way. Okay. I think um, th- there's actually some historical evidence about things that happened to the Edomites and then the Ishmaelites, um, I mean, that, that's a whole separate discussion. You know, what I was talking about is certainly if, if you say to an, uh, an ultra-Orthodox Jew in Jerusalem, you know, those horrible Edomites, he knows exactly what you're talking about. You mean Christians. And if you say those horrible Ishmaelites or those wonderful Ishmaelites and wonderful Edomites, he, he knows exactly what you're talking about. Sure. You're talking about the, the Muslims and the Christians. Um, that's what it is wow. in Jewish culture. Does that mean that's what it is biblically? I'm not saying that at all. I, I don't even think that's what it is. 
but that's definitely how it's been identified historically. It's traditional understanding. And this is the power of our this yeah. is the power of this collaboration, having what the traditions are and our, our our backgrounds, and also what our understanding is in terms of scriptures. And, and just one little uh, um, sort of piquant uh, um, note is that so the entire book of Obadiah is about the retribution that will be upon the Edomites in the end time, or at some point in the future anyway. It hasn't hasn't happened yet. And that has been understood by Jewish sources as referring to what will happen to Rome and then by extension, the Roman Catholic Church. Wow. That is really, that's got my, okay. <laughs> that really is food for thought because I've never heard yeah. that before. That's awesome. But in any case, Yehovah yeah. said to her, yeah. two nations are in your womb. Two people, two people shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. And so when her days were fulfilled, uh, for her to give birth, and indeed there were twins in her womb. Now, here we go. You ready? And the wow. first one came out red, and he was like a hairy garment all over. So, what, what? I mean, we find out later, all right, guys, we find out later that he was as hairy as goat's hair. I mean, it was uh, Jacob that fooled, that, that tricked his father into believing that he was Esau with goat's hair. I mean, this is one hairy little yeah. baby, right? Yeah, he's a he's a hairy little bugger. <laughs> he's, a, he's a hairy little dude. Right. I mean, he is yeah. he's impressively hairy, and he's it would appear uh, red. So ready, uh, ready, reddish. Now and, that and that's where we that's where he one of the reasons he later gets the name Edom because mm-hmm. Edom means red. Yeah, so, Edom, so there red. he is, and he's red. And I mean, if that happens today, that'd really make the papers, wouldn't it? I mean, there's there's some front page news. A uh, little red hairy dude. Um, I, I don't know. If that's so unusual for a child to be born very hairy. I mean. Is that all that unusual? We're talking about his arms, right? I mean, he, she, uh, he felt, I say felt his arms, which yes. uh, they could put goats in. I mean, I got some well, goats and they're pretty hairy. Right. Okay. That, what, that doesn't, right. doesn't strike you as weird? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not like unheard of. It, it's probably, I guess, not common, but it's not unheard of. Okay. So. Hairy little dude. It, 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 was no, it was noteworthy. It was that unusual. It was noteworthy. Afterwards, his brother came out and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Now, what is the significance of the name here? So the word for heel is Akave, and the word, the name Jacob is Yaakov from the same root. Mm -hmm. And so Yaakov could literally be translated as he heals or he grabs the heel. He does something with the heel. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's essentially the uh, explanation for the name Jacob, Yaakov, because he grabbed onto the heel. Okay. There we go. So the boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man. Keith, he was a he. He dwelt in tents. He was a dweller in tents. What does that suggest to you? He was a mama's boy. He was a mama's boy. <laughs> I don't. I don't think that's what it means. I think it means he was, I, the reason I the reason oh. I said mama's boy is that, yeah. that he that he stayed that he stayed around uh, he stayed around a tent and his mother was around him more. So I, that's why I was. Using I, I think what it means is that he was a shepherd. Whereas uh, Esau, really? Esau, Esau was a hunter. And, you know, you, you go out into the deserts where they, these, where they lived in, you know, what's today Israel's Negev Desert. Back then, certainly, you had herds of hundreds of thousands of um, gazelle and antelope and even deer that they could go out and hunt. But it was, it was a grueling task to uh, hunt these animals. It was not a simple matter. Mm. And so somebody who's going to be hunting them is going to be following these herds. Whereas Jacob presumably dwelling in tents means that he's following his uh, domesticated herds in the tent, which uh, would then be, um, you know, would be a shepherd. And, and the reason I think that is in Genesis chapter four, verse 20, it talks about, it says an Ada begat um, or bore uh, Yaval in Hebrew. Mm-hmm. And it says he was the father of all those who dwell in a tent, literally who dwell in a tent mm-hmm. and uh, umikne and flock or have flocks. So dwelling in a tent and having flocks, those in, in the Hebrew mind are, are those are synonymous. Okay, they, they right. go and, together. And, and, right. so and this... Why do you dwell in a tent if you have flocks? Because what happens is your flock will eat up, it'll eat up the entire area, they'll, they'll graze over the entire area, and then you have to move on, and you have to constantly being moving on, you know, and then it's seasonal. So then eventually the, 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 yeah, so the uh, so vegetation nomadic. grows back. So it's, it's, it's making it's, points about his lifestyle. So, yeah. Right. And actually, when I studied archaeology, they, they made the point that none of the Bedouin in the Middle East are really nomadic. They said that the, the proper definition of nomadic is something like the uh, Mongols, the ancient mm-hmm. Mongols, who used to travel thousands of miles every year, whereas the Middle Eastern nomads travel something on the order of maybe hundreds of miles. But the more common thing is they would travel, you know, I don't know, some less than 100 miles per year. Um, so nomadic may be a slight exaggeration, but uh, okay. they were definitely semi-nomadic. Sure. That they needed to go um, 
you know, in the one area in the winter, and then the other area in the summer, and then they mm-hmm. would, you know, make a circuit and come back. And that's why they're living in a tent. You got to move and follow the flocks. Follow the flock. Now, this is the second time, if I if I recall correctly, I think this is the second time that a, a skilled hunter is mentioned in the Bible. The first is Nimrod mm-hmm. in uh, yeah. Yeah. chapter ten. Chapter ten. And so, uh, and so this is the second time that a hunter is mentioned. So this is interesting. But in any case, Keith, the next verse certainly does suggest that he is a mama's boy. And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. Right. Hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's just interesting that, that the, the Bible basically gives us this sort of, you know, if you use the word, uh, picture of what's going on, being that um, Esau is the one that's out hunting and, and going out and getting the game. And, and the fruit of that for Isaac is he loves the fact that his son brings back this great game mm-hmm. and that Rebecca loved Jacob. And why that is, who knows? Maybe it's because he hangs around the tents more. I don't know. But he mm. certainly knew how to cook. And uh, when uh, Esau came back, he came and he said, listen, I'm hungry. And Jacob was there cooking. And uh, he says, I want my I want this food. And, and then I think that's where this this really gets interesting is that uh, Jacob is able to look at uh, Esau and say, you know, with foresight, because he says, OK, well, listen, you're hungry. You have a need. I have a desire. Mm-hmm. Your need is you want food. I desire to have your birthright. And And I just think it's so interesting that Esau makes this decision based on the, the, the now and not mm-hmm. the future. And that's certainly something that we see in society also is that, you know, so many times people make a decision based on the now, the right now, the need right now, and not the, not the big picture. So I, I, I just wanted to bring that out. And this is, this is a fascinating uh, uh, few verses uh, where Jacob says, sell me your birthright as uh, of this day. Esau said, look, I'm about to die. I mean, clearly he's famished. I'm about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew and lentils, and he ate and drank, arose and went on his way, and Esau despised his birthright. What is what is the implications of that, Nachemia? I don't know that it needs implications. <laughs> he despised his, you know, he, he, he didn't value it, um, and so he sold it for a, a, literally for a bowl of red lentil soup. And, you know, red lentil is a play on words, adom, adom. Adom means red and also means it's a type of lentil, red lentil. And so that's where you get the name Edom from red lentil. So there's essentially three reasons, red, lentil, and uh, he came out red at you know, two and a half. So he's despising his birthright. It's interesting. Did he despise it after he sold it or, did he despise, or, or, or was he selling it, the act of despising it? I think, uh, and I guess you could read it either way. Yeah, I guess so. I, I would, I would go with the latter, but the birthright, now we're, talk, we're obviously talking about the birthright of the firstborn, right? Right. And the birthright of the firstborn is really interesting what that is. The birthright of the firstborn in the Bible and in, in ancient times and, and confirmed in, in the Torah and Deuteronomy is a double portion. So it, when, uh, you know, theoretically, if let's say there was, uh, you know, I don't know, a hundred sheep, 99 sheep. Mm-hmm. So according to having the birthright, Esau was supposed to get 66 of the sheep and um, Jacob would have gotten 33 of the sheep because he mm-hmm. gets a double portion. And we'll come back to that, I think in the actual blessing sure. that, that the, the blessing was a double portion but i'm, I'm, I'm well, jumping I think ahead the other thing that's really 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 interesting here is that um you know jacob didn't sit down and say okay listen here's the deed to your birthright or here's the contract he simply says to him swear to me mm-hmm. so mm. he swore an oath to him and again this is such a you know there's there's this theme and we and i know that we'll talk about it later just the significance of swearing but the, the fact that regardless of what you'll say about Esau in terms of him selling his birthright, he understood what it meant to swear. And when right, he absolutely. swore, he knew that that would, that would close the deal. And that exact, that's exactly what happened. So he, right. he didn't come back later and say, well, where, where's, where's the written deed? Where's the contract? Where, where did I sign that says I mm-hmm. owe you? It's just, he knows he said it. And in saying it, you know, you almost wonder if he didn't swear by uh, oh, oh. the name. Pearl, 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 pearl. <laughs> well, I mean, pearl, yeah, pearl. In, in biblical times, they swore, Chai Yehovah, as Yehovah lives. And, yeah. and so that was the common way of swearing. So presumably, if he swore an oath, he was saying the name of the God of Israel, of mm-hmm. Yehovah, mm-hmm. and or that, at that time, the God of Isaac and Abraham. So uh, presumably he did, and that was understood to be a legally binding act, making a, a, exactly. an oath like that. And, and, exactly, so that Jacob... Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say you're right. You're right, Keith, in that you say that the um, there is a theme throughout this Torah portion of the uh, incredible weight and binding power of words. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, in the very next section we have then uh, we have uh, another oath, another vow being made, which is um, God is then swearing to Isaac. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. In the very next uh, section, we you know we see in verse three he says, uh, "Live in la- this land, and I will be with you, and I will bless you." 
for, for you and your seed, I will give all of these lands that I have established as an oath, which I swore to Abraham, your mm-hmm. father. So we have this reiteration of the, of the oath. And, mm-hmm. um, and what's interesting is verse five, because in verse five, he says, why did I give this oath? Why did I you know, make this promise? What, how did uh, Abraham become worthy of it? And it says, uh, because he, Abraham obeyed my voice and he kept my, uh, and this word mishmarti could be translated as he kept my, my, uh, my, my, um, my treasure or something that's to be guarded mm-hmm. and my commandments and my statutes and my, to- and my laws, my instructions, my Torah. Now there's four and, and so, categories there, right? I, I mean, yeah. in the New King James, I've got, uh, it says, because Abraham obeyed my voice. Is number one and kept my charge. It's number two. Actually, number says, that's right. So there's actually five categories. He kept, he, he obeyed my voice. He kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Is there, uh, I mean, uh, my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and laws. Clearly, yeah. there is some sort of code of conduct going on here. Is oh, yeah, there's definitely there? code of conduct. Absolutely. And the question then becomes what were these commandments, statutes, laws, and, and charge? What were those things? And we don't really know. You know, maybe it was everything that was later revealed to Moses. That's one mm-hmm. possibility. That's one opinion. Um, the other opinion is that, well, no, he gradually was revealing things because if he gave it all at once, it would have overwhelmed them. So those are the two possibilities. And we don't really know the answer. It must be more than just circumcision because you wouldn't need four categories that's for right. circumcision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's well, isn't it clear. interesting if we, if we just simply read every interaction that Abraham has, Abram and Abraham, uh, first name and the name that was... Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, given to him that yeah. when we read every time that we see the interaction between Abram and uh, Yehovah, that there is something that he's doing. So he tells him, "Go," and what does he do? He goes, and he tells him, "Go," and he tells him, "Do this," and he tells him, "Do that," and he does these things. Now, I mean, I know, you know, I, I don't know again in whether it was all revealed to him before or whether it was something that he didn't want to overwhelm him with. Mm-hmm. But I, what I think is interesting is that as Abram and Abraham has these interactions, he's obedient. Mm-hmm. And the obedience is to the charge, the command, the voice of the creator of the universe. I mm-hmm. mean, and, and I, I, I just think it's, um, you know, when I read that, it doesn't, it doesn't trip me up too much because when I read it, I'm like, oh, yeah, look, yeah, here's where he heard his voice. Abraham, mm-hmm. leave. Here's mm-hmm. where he heard his command. Oh, circumcise your kid. Oh, here's where he heard his charge. Hey, let's take your son up to the, to the you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there's, there's this really cool picture of Abraham walking out uh, the, the Torah of God, the teaching and instruction of God. So mm. that's all mm. I would like to say about that. Mm-hmm. Amen, amen. And so now it goes into uh, a story that we're so familiar with the, by, by the time we get here in the Torah portion because we've heard it all before, haven't we? I mean, it, it happens twice with uh, Abraham and now mm-hmm. uh, like father, like son. And so we have uh, uh, Isaac uh, telling the guys, hey, she's my sister, refers to my sister. And uh, and it all sort of goes down in a very very similar way. In verse ten, uh, Abimelech said, <laughs> "Wait, wait, 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 whoa, wait, 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 wait. We got to let Nehemiah. No, no, hold on. We've got to let Nehemiah tell us about verse eight again." Okay, yeah, we mentioned this in a previous uh, Torah portion. No, this is important. Uh, uh, yeah. This verse eight, because now we've got to we've got to use this. We got to do a backtrack. So, okay. tell so us then, about and Abimelech looked out, uh, and Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out of the window, and he saw, and behold, Isaac was mitzachik. He was. Mitzachik. He was, pl- you could translate as playing, but really uh, you have the, the, the uh, not to get too technical, but you have something called the PL, which can often refer to an iteration or a, rep- a repeated action. So mitzachek means he's playing around. Mitzachek uh, at Rivka Yishto, he's playing around with Rivka, his wife. And he understands immediately that this is his wife, because you don't, you know, you don't do that with a sister. <laughs> right? Except, except well, in like Alabama. Maybe. No, uh, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> So we'll cut that out of the, in the edit. No, actually, yeah, even sure. it. Um, it was funny. <laughs> so, uh, you know, behold, uh, Isaac is, is playing around, and that implies there's this sexual um, uh, interaction. I mean, obviously. Sure. And, um, and what we had mentioned in the previous portion is that, um, is that Ishmael was seen mitzachik with, hmm. um, with Isaac, and the immediate reaction to that was, was um, Sarah saying, you got to get rid of this kid. Rid of you got to take him out. You know, which, you know, now we can understand why she had such a, a severe reaction and, and said, you know, banish your child because this was a right. child that was, was um, doing something that, that must not be done. Mm. And, so the uh, casual reading, the casual yeah. reading is as if to say that, you know, uh, Ishmael and Isaac are, are out playing, you know, and he's roughhousing with him. Mm-hmm. And the casual reading is that uh, Isaac and, uh, and Rivka are playing patty cake 
Right. And <laughs> patty cakes or Scrabble or something like this. Well, when you teach us the children, that's what you explain to them. But when you're an adult, you understand that these are these are um you, know, you understand the connotation here. Mm. Okay. I actually I actually read this. You know, I remember reading this when I was a a child, and I was probably like in third grade or something like that, or second grade. I think second grade actually. And uh, you know, they they didn't tell us what this meant. And uh, then we got to uh, Genesis, I believe it's uh, 39, the section of uh, of Tamar and you know, Tamar and Judah. They actually just skipped that chapter because that was, you know, that you can't, you know, whitewash for children. Um, but I think, you know what, this is the word of God that's supposed to be read out to the entire people of Israel and children can handle it. I think we should give them more credit, um, especially today's children. They know more about it than we do. <laughs> True. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wrong. Well, when we come to these sections, I'll be the one to explain it because you and Jonah are just a little bit too, uh, too straightforward on this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so first well, one says, to um, then You want to maintain the euphemisms, huh? Abimelech called Isaac and said, Quite obviously she is your wife. So how could you say she is my sister? Isaac said, Because I thought, lest I die on, you know, on her account. Uh, he said, What is this? You've, it's almost like he's saying to them, What are you doing? What is with you guys? Come on. I mean, you're married to her. What is this you have done to us? One of the people might have lain with your wife and uh, would have brought guilt on us and so on and so forth. And uh, and so it goes on. And so now for the sake of time, because we're about halfway through, I reckon, can we, unless you guys want to, Keith, do you want to jump back? I'm thinking, can we get to chapter 27? Uh, I actually want to do something at the end of 26 if we can. There's let's do that really, now. And I'll do it really quickly. There's this um, section here where he digs three wells. And, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the reservation now and bring the symbolic interpretation of, of the rabbis. Okay. I'm not saying this is what it means, but this is the symbolic understanding. Mm-hmm. There were three wells. Verse 20, it says, and he called the name of the well Esek. Esek, and it says, Kihitaskuimo, for they strove with him. And Esek means strife. In verse 21, they dig a second well, and he calls it Sitna. And he doesn't say why he called it Sitna. But we, if you read it, if you know Hebrew, it's obvious. Sitna is like the same word as Satan. It means adversary, enemy. So sitna means enmity or, or adversity. Uh, and then finally he digs the third well, and it's only the third well that the enemies of, of uh, Isaac don't come to fight with him. Finally, with the third well, he gets it right. Everything is happy. It's called Rehovot, it says, because Yehovah broadened the land and, and we fl- uh, broadened uh, things and we flourished in the land. Um, for now, Yehovah has broadened us and we have flourished in the land. And the word for broaden is hirchiv, and that's where you get the word rechovot. And so the symbolic interpretation, I'm not saying this is what it means, I'm saying this is how it's been symbolically interpreted by Jews throughout the generations, is that this refers to the three temples. That the first temple, the enemies of Israel came and they destroyed it. The second temple, we had the enemy come and destroy it. And finally, the third one, that's the one where Yehovah will broaden us, he'll widen us, and we will flourish in the land. Come on, can I get an amen? Yeah, Woo! That's really cool. <laughs> it is cool. I mean, you completely le- I can't believe it. What's the reservation? The I, I missed this. No, no, you left the farm and now you now you want to <laughs> preach and, and you want to come up with interpretations? Where, where does it say that, Nehemiah? No, I didn't say it says that. I'm just saying that's, you know, if you want to take it symbolically. Hey, look, uh, I'm, I'm that, liking that. that. That's I'm liking the symbolic meaning. It's been maybe. taken symbolically. That there's obviously the literal interpretation, which is, val- is, is the primary valid interpretation, but I think well, it is interesting. I would like to. You know, uh, Jono, if it's okay, oh, please. Uh, I would like to to, to uh, be the, uh, the 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 textual person here for a moment and and not get excited about Nehemiah's preaching and his, <laughs> and his interpretation. Uh, I think he he quickly he quickly did something I thought he was going to do, but he quickly moved to this uh, this interpretation and he and he passed over something that I thought was he was going to do, and I I, I let him waited for him to do it, and he didn't do it. He casually went by this word um, in verse twenty one. And I want you, Nehemiah, if you would, just to go back again yeah. to the word in verse 21. This is the Torah pearl. They dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also, so he named it Satan. Right, or Sitna, which is from the same root. Sitna, as- or Satan. So is this not the, the very um, root of the word for, and you mentioned it, uh, for what we call... Hang on, no, 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 if I'm understanding, if I'm understanding Keith, it, it comes from the same root as, as Satan, or Hasatan, and mm-hmm. my understanding is that means yeah. uh, the accuser, and so when it says quarreling, is it, are they oh, accusing? No, I, I, no, actually, Satan doesn't mean accuser. Um, that's a right. later understanding of the word. The, the literal meaning in Hebrew of Satan is enemy. And hence, they often will translate it as adversary because there's another word right. for enemy in Hebrew. Um, but it just means enemy. And it talks about in, in the Bible how um, uh, the Philistines talk, the Philistine king uh, of Gat, Achish, they talk about how uh, David will be their Satan. They'll be, he'll be their enemy. 
And it talks about how uh, God raised up a Satan for Solomon after he sinned. And it wasn't some demonic force. It was the, it was the king of, of Syria, the Aramaic-speaking king of Syria. So, so you have these um, Satans throughout the Bible. In fact, in, uh, one of the first ones is uh, in Numbers chapter 22, where it says the angel of Jehovah stood as a Satan against uh, Balaam. Now, he wasn't the devil, as we understand it, or as Christians understand it, I should say. The angel of Jehovah obviously wasn't a devil, but he was to Balaam a Satan, a Satan, an enemy. And what, and what that meant is that if Balaam, Bilam, did not follow the word of God, then this angel would be his enemy and would, and would, would harm him or, or um, possibly uh, you know, lead him into other situations. So, and, and so Satan means enemy in, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, is the enemy not of God, but of man. If we okay. sin now, so you're blowing my mind. There's so much in the Torah portion here. You're literally the blowing Torah, my no, mind. I'm sitting here. I'm, I can't believe I'm Jono. You guys, I, I, I'm giving the Shemir the chance to give me the softball, and he and he took the softball. So <laughs> it's obvious. You want me to say the obvious? That's obvious. Here's my. Before you get blown away, Jono. Before you get to your whole thing, where you're going to about you know drop the bomb. The reason I wanted to bring this word, or, or to for us to take a moment to shine on this word, is that in the English Bible, oftentimes we'll see the word adversary in, in the translation. And, and that, that word adversary could be translated to be consistent as, and he was a Satan. So the reason that I wanted to, to have people take a look at this is because you gotta, you gotta, before we go to the New Testament, which oftentimes becomes the case, uh, people will look at the New Testament first and then they'll take that and back translate that into the Tanakh. Well, what the translators sometimes did is said, hey, we don't want to confuse you with the fact that really, we're talking about the same word, Satan, which could have been Satan, but we have a wonderful capitalized Satan who's got horns and a fork. <laughs> and we certainly don't want people to see that. So I wanted, that's why I wanted Nehemiah to, to slow down on that particular, that particular Look, verse. Just linguistically that you could find Satan yeah. many times in the Tanakh, but instead what you find is the word adversary, and that's so that people don't get confused about the one with the, uh, the, uh, the horns and the fork. <laughs> and the fork and the red suit. So. Right. Okay, so in the same way, uh, let me see if I got this right. In the same way that, say, a word like Mashiach is such an interesting word study throughout the, the Tanakh, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, so to and, and various applications for the word Mashiach, uh, so too is, and I mean, I was blown away by that. I found that absolutely fascinating to do a, a, a word study on that, but you're saying the same applies, particularly from uh, backgrounds like um, history, religious history like myself and maybe like yourself, Keith, where we have a certain understanding, we think that's what it means, but the word Satan is also found throughout the Tanakh and has varying applications. That really blows my mind. I haven't done that study. I'm going to be doing it this week. Here's an interesting Good. statistic. So the word Satan in various forms of it, like Sitna, appears in the Hebrew 35 times. Um, and I'll let people look up themselves how many times it appears in the King James Version. It is far less um, in the Old Testament I'm talking about. Sure. And I don't remember the exact number, but it's, it's, it's almost like half that number. Sure. 35 times. And I think that's yeah. why, you know, I know, I know and, we want to rush to the next. And so you get a different understanding of it based on, you know, yeah, the, if you only look at half the evidence, you get a different understanding of what it is. Sure. And this is where I think people, Jono, can, can take one of these pearls, just like something like this. They can take this pearl and do their own study. They can go in and find out how many times this word is used. And, and they would find that, um, that it, you know, there are decisions that were being made because if you've already got this understanding of what the word Satan is, capitalizing it mm-hmm. and, and saying this is Satan versus the fact that there is the adversary, I just think it's something that people can do on their own. They'd be quite surprised. Mm. Now we can move on with Nehemiah's shouting and yelling and preaching about the three times. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I just looked it up. It's 20 times in the, in the Tanakh, in the King James. There it is. Versus 20 times. 35. In English, well, in, the, in the Hebrew, oh, 35. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So there's 15 times that the word appears in Hebrew that isn't translated to Satan in English. It's translated as you know, enemy or adversary or with right. a small a, with a, you know, or a small e as enemy. Yep. And, and if you don't read and know the Hebrew, you have no idea it's got anything to do with Satan, even though that's the word in Hebrew. There's okay. our homework for this week, listeners. There you go. Something to look forward to. And you know, while, while we're talking about it, I mean, I, I mentioned Mashiach. I think it's uh, in the Tanakh, in the in the King James, with a capital M as Messiah. I think twice in the same passage of Daniel. But I think off the top of my head, I think right. it's used thirty nine times. But that's a different topic altogether. Okay. Yeah. Esau sells his birthright. Now Jacob cooks. You know, we did that. What are we doing? Going on to. Uh, you see, you brought me back, and I'm on the wrong page. Uh, Isaac, 27. chapter twenty seven. Twenty seven. Isaac blesses <laughs> Jacob. 
Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see that he called Esau, his older brother, and said to him, uh, he said, my, my son, and he answered him, here I am. Uh, now behold, I am old. And he's going to, uh, he, he sees that he's going to pass at any given moment. He wants to bless him. And he says, look, go and hunt that game that I love so much. Make that stew that I love so much. Bring it back to me, my son, and I will bless you. And what we're about to see is, again, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Keith, is the power and binding uh, power of, of words. This really fascinates me. Now, Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son, and Esau went into the field to hunt uh, game and to bring it. So Rebecca spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, indeed, so they've got favorites, right? And <laughs> we're playing, playing a bit of the favorites going on here, saying, indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, go and get the, the food and I'm going to give you a blessing and so on and so forth. Therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me two choice kids. That, now, Keith, see? Anyway, uh, two choice kids of the goats. And I will make savory food from them for your father such that he loves. You should take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. Jacob said to his mother, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man and I'm a smooth skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me and he will he, know that I'm a deceiver. Bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. His mother said, Nehemiah, his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice. And go and get them. Now, does she have the power to do this? I mean, is that, st- I mean, are we talking about the power of words here again? That she has the ability I don't, I don't, to, to, I mean, look, I, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know that she does. Um, like in what sense does she, you know, I mean, she said it, but would, would it have, would that have actually, I, I don't think she does. I think if, if that curse really has any power, then someone else doesn't have the, the power to then take it upon themselves. Okay. Well, I think the, the thing that jumped off for me in that is just that. Well, the important thing that jumped off the page in that verse was was a little in, an insight into who Jacob is based on this one line. In verse 11, Jacob said to Rivka, his mother, oh, no, this is wrong. We shouldn't do this. No, he says, listen, how are we going to trick him? I'm going to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in other words, his, his first response wasn't, you know, oh, my gosh, this is bad. This is wrong. He's like, look, I've got smooth skin. What are we going to do, Mom? How yeah, gonna, no, he's going to hey, like this? what you're talking about. It's a good idea, but... <laughs> He's a hairy a little werewolf, idea, and I'm I've really pro- smooth. We've got a problem. Huh? <laughs> and what was funny, what I did uh, yesterday was I was looking again at the, the age, and Isaac, based on uh, what I'm seeing here, is that it's, it later it says Esau was 40. So if we had 40 years to 60, that's 100 years old at least, based on what we've, what we've learned in the previous chapter. So here's Isaac, 100 years old. He's an old man. He can't see very well. Here's his younger wife. We don't know how much younger, mm-hmm. but she's there listening to him saying, okay, how are we going to do this? She brings her son in, and the son doesn't say one thing about we shouldn't do this. You know, he, he doesn't. He doesn't feel bad. He doesn't feel guilty. He's like, how is it that we're going to get this done? Mm. So I, I just thought that that was interesting because we find later when when Esau, you know, says, "Isn't that why they call Jacob X?" Again, don't we get two different meanings for his name, which we can get to in just mm. a second? So I just wanted to say that that's that that was what caught me. It's just that his response was, "How will we trick him?" Not. Should we trick him? Yeah, no, that, that yeah. is that is interesting. And all he wants is an airtight plan, which the best they yeah. could have come up with is put the goat skin on him. <laughs> just, just go yeah. for it. What, what, what's interesting uh, to me in this whole story is a few things. But one of them is, is that in verse twenty, we, you know, uh, Isaac asked Jacob. He says, "How did you get here so fast? Mm-hmm. Like the story mm-hmm. isn't plausible. Like, wait a minute, you're hunting. Hunting takes time. You have to sit there and you have to wait. How did you get here so quickly?" And look what Jacob says. He says, Because Yehovah, your God, has caused it to happen before me, or my presence. Mm-hmm. And so he, he's not taking credit himself. He's attributing his success to Yehovah. And look how different that is from Esau. Esau is this mighty hunter, and he trusts in his own might. And uh, he doesn't give credit to God anywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he thinks the blessing is coming entirely from his father. You know, and, and, and doesn't value the blessing from Yehovah. And, and here, here to me is what's the key point. So if you compare word for word the blessing that Jacob got versus the blessing that Esau got, mm-hmm. they're almost identical. Both of them have this, what I guess you could call in modern terms, financial wealth. You know, the fatness of the earth mm-hmm. and the dew of the heavens. And they also have what you would call, um, I guess, in ancient terms, you know, it's, it talks about how you're going to live by your sword and you're going to dominate 
So they have dominance over others as well um, and independence. Mm -hmm. So I guess you could call that sovereignty. So, so you have those two key elements in both blessings that we're going to have somebody who is, is you know, sovereign and, and even rules over others. And they have this wealth that they're going to get. And um, so both of them have that. So what is really the difference between the blessing? And I think the difference between the blessing is at the end where he says to Jacob, he adds this one little tiny phrase. He says, uh, he who curses you will be cursed and he who blesses you will be blessed. And if you look back in Gen earlier in Genesis, that was the exact same thing that God had blessed to uh, Abraham. And that was then passed on from Abraham to Isaac. And now Isaac is passing on that blessing to Jacob. And he doesn't give that to, to uh, Esau. He only gives it to Jacob. And that essentially is the covenant. That is the, um, the marker of that covenant. That's the consistent thread that is being passed to Jacob. That means, okay, you're in the line and you have the relationship with Yehovah. Esau doesn't have that. Mm. He doesn't have that blessing, uh, the blessing of, of, of the, that relationship with Yehovah. And, and so I look at this, and maybe I'm preaching too much here, but I look at this as the double portion. He's got the physical. That's the whole first part of the blessing. And then he's got the spiritual. And Esau, Esau only has the physical. And that's what the double portion is of the firstborn right that he, he had gotten from Esau. Okay, so I, I have a question in, in regards to this. Can I get an amen from someone? I, I, <laughs> complete silence. <laughs> Keith, what happened? <laughs> you should be shouting. <laughs> no, I don't understand. No, because I'm, I'm still thinking about well, this. Let's move on. Let's I can't move on because I'm stuck on. Journal, let's move on. <laughs> I'm stuck on verse 20 before I can give you an amen because okay. what's going on here is he's, I mean, yeah. clearly Jacob is, is out to deceive his father to get the blessing. Uh, his father says, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He says, because Yehovah, your Elohim brought it to me. Now, is there a problem here? Because he's, he's evoking the name in conjunction with, uh, with deceit, right? I mean, well, what he's saying is technically true. I mean, actually, literally it says, because Yehovah, your God has caused it to happen before me, which is true. Okay. He didn't say uh, he um, <laughs> hunted it, but, you know, his mama brought it to him. And that sure. was, uh, you know, okay. he sees that as, as the providence of Yehovah, you know. Not to mention that he says that he says Yehovah, your God, mm -hmm. speaking to his father. So it's like, you know, he's, he's like, looking, look, yeah, look, God, dude, this is your this is your God. Mm -hmm. This is the one that, uh, that's done this. So, I mean, he, you know, he basically puts it, you know, he, he says this is your God who's done this. Mm. And the very next thing he does, uh, because he's, he's a bit suspicious. Now, mind you, to take a couple of goat kids and to um, uh, slaughter them and butcher them and then uh, you make a stew. I mean, we're talking at least a couple of hours, I would say. But uh, he's still suspicious and he wants to see his ID card, right? So he says, come here, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. And so, you know, there he is and uh, gives him the, the goat's hair and he feels him and he says, yeah, sounds like Jacob, but good enough. And then verse 24 is really interesting. And, and I'm and I'm I'm just going to, well, let's look at it. It says mm. literally in Hebrew, uh, and he said, are you, and, and this is like, the, he'd already asked him, are, are you my son? And mm. you know, Esau, and he's like, yeah, I am. In verse uh, 19, he says, Anuchi Esav b'cholecha. I am Esav, your, your firstborn. And that's an outright lie. That's mm. just a lie. Um, but then in verse 24, he says something a little bit more subtle. He says, Atada bani Esav, are you my son Esav? Are you really my son Esav? Vayomer, and he said, Ani, I am. And I'm just going to put that out there of someone else in history who had asked a question, and the answer was, I am. Let's move on. Okay. <laughs> and everyone, everyone you, out you of radio. You may cut that out in the editing. <laughs> no, no, no. no, I'm going to leave it there. No, I know what you're talking about, oh. but... But, you know, you're breaking one of your own rules, and we don't have time to do that right now. <laughs> oh, so. No, so. I'm, 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 you this, know what? I don't know what it is. Jonah, maybe he had coffee this morning. But oh, I had like, lots of coffee. Woo! Come on. <laughs> three cups. No, three or four things. Somebody say three. Gone completely, <laughs> he's gone completely off the farm. So, uh, okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay. And so here we go. He's, he's, he's got the stew, and now he, he blesses him. Now, let me read the blessing. Surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which Jehovah has blessed. I mean, that's beautiful. Therefore, may God give you uh, of the dew of the heavens, of the fatness of the earth, the plenty of grain and wine, and let the people serve you, nations bow down to you, be master uh, over your brethren. That's a key. And uh, let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you. Blessed be everyone who blesses you. Now, just a little bit after that, the little hairy dude turns up with the um, hunted game. Yeah. And... Hairy. That Esau, here he is. And this, this fascinates me because Isaac, he, he finds out that he's been deceived. And we're looking at verse 33. Isaac trembled exceedingly 
He trembled exceedingly. What is the Hebrew word? What are the Hebrew word there for in 33 Nehemiah? Ad ma'od, which ma'od, you know what ma'od means? Ma'od means very. And ad ma'od uh, uh, is like literally until very. Meaning he wasn't just doing it. He, he was doing it until the point it was very. Okay. That, that means extreme, gotcha. extremely much. Okay. Go that, ahead. That reminds me of, uh, I think it was atzpani is the word that you told mm-hmm. me once. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's not the word it uses here. The word it uses here is vayecherad. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's actually where we get the modern word charidi. Which is that's what, what I was waiting but, for, but, but you don't want to you don't want to make the but, connection. But <laughs> what the ultra orthodox Jews call themselves, uh, they call themselves Haredi, which they explain as meaning they're shaking before God. And here it's you know saying Isaac shook a a, gr- a great shaking even much, or uh, Admaod. And so here it's a shaking in anger rather than a shaking in fear of God. Okay. And what is this the different group called? Haredi is is and we usually translate in English as ultra orthodox Jews. Exactly. That's what I, I mean. That was the softball, Nehemi. I'm trying to give you the softball. Now. You're over in Israel. I don't, I don't know why that's relevant for the Torah portion, but okay. I mean, I guess we have. What do you mean? Why is it relevant? There's a group of people that are that are the ultra orthodox Jews who mm-hmm. believe that they, they tremble. They tremble before God. And the, the reason I wanted to say something about this, you know, so many times there's this, you know, we have this approach to different groups of people, whether we call them Methodist or ultra orthodox or whatever it is that we we do. But there usually is a meaning behind what it is that the people do and why they do it. Now, whether it has become something that they didn't intend, mm-hmm. but sometimes there are some there are some things that come out that are actually um, kind of powerful. When I was over in Israel and I was sitting down with an ultra ultra orthodox uh, woman, and she was explaining why she was, you know, what it was about this this idea of the the um, the ultra orthodox and where the the root of the word and all of that sort of thing, it kind of gave me a different picture. The idea of trembling before God. Now, regardless of where, where we right. and, and it actually comes from Isaiah sixty six five, where it says, yeah. uh, "Hear the word of Jehovah, those who tremble at His word." Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and you know, so there it uses the word charidim, and then it also appears mm-hmm. again. In, uh, it's repeated in Ezra ten verse three, also charidim, those who tremble at the commandment of our God. So, so I'm this trying to start, is, a, new, used I'm in trying a, to start a new movement. That uh, that is the the, the tremblers, <laughs> and we're based on uh, Isaac uh, a trembling in the situation. Are there are already is, Quakers you know, so over there. Is, isn't that what it's Quakers, Quakers and they're shakers? Quakers and, they and shakers and this term from the same word. Okay, we you're, the, you're the tremblers, huh, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. In any case, he trembles exceedingly uh, and says, "Who, where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me, and I ate it before uh, you came, and I have blessed him, and this is it. This is what it says." And indeed, he shall be blessed. Now, this is this gets me wondering. What I want to know is, is it Yehovah who blesses him, or is it an authority that Yehovah has given to uh, Isaac, uh, being the father, who, you know, who who makes this blessing? Once he's made this blessing, despite the fact that he's been deceived, it shall happen. I mean, how Keith? How do you understand this? Uh, that's a good question, and I, I would actually. Um Look at, I guess, if you could say the the picture, the picture being all the way back to uh, Jacob being aware of the fact that there was a blessing to the firstborn, mm-hmm. that that was something that existed. When did that start? How, how was that introduced? Jacob clearly knew that there was a, a blessing to the firstborn, mm-hmm. and that's what he wanted. And so when I'm tracking through this, I'm looking at this as, as okay, th- this is a fact, and now the fact uh, that he's been able to wrestle that <laughs> from his brother means it's going to come to him. And how did it come? Whether it was through uh, him doing what he did with the uh, the uh, the food mm-hmm. or putting on his brother's clothing or catching his father at a time of weakness where he was, you know, he couldn't see. In the end, what he knew that he wanted, he was going to get. And, and, that, is, and that is exactly what he got. Okay, so uh, Isaac has made a blessing, but uh, he was deceived into making the blessing. If it if it extends from uh, from Yehovah, surely why would Ye- why why wouldn't Yehovah just correct it and say no, it's invalid, it's not going to happen, I'm not going to bless that because uh, y- you were tricked. Right. Okay. So the way I look at it is that this is a, a blessing that God gave Abraham, and then for Abraham passed it on to Isaac, and then Isaac passed it on to Jacob, and, or Isaac had the opportunity to pass it on to his son, and he could have chosen either sons. You know, Abraham was told, you've got to give it to Isaac. Isaac wasn't told that. He wasn't told who to give it to. And so he could have given it to Esau. The prophecy uh, that was given to Rivka, to Rebecca, is that it would go to the younger son. And so she went through all this effort to make sure the younger son got it to fulfill that prophecy. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, but ultimately it was, it was Isaac who had to give it to someone. 
And he had that choice, actually. He could have given it theoretically to Esau. Sure. And, so it's um, an authority that's given to the father by Yehovah right. to pass well, to the son. Well, but, the, but that, from the time of Jacob, it's no longer then passed on. This, this covenant, the covenant of Abraham, is no longer passed on by a father to a son through a blessing. It's passed on after that through inheritance. Mm-hmm. And after, basically from the time of Jacob, the sons have to receive this, this covenant. And, you know, unless they break the covenant and then they're cut off. But if, if they uh, go through the covenant of circumcision that was given to Abraham and they embrace that covenant, then they automatically receive it. And then it's other th- another thing is built in there where, where later on in Egypt where this mixed multitude can also receive the covenant, even if they aren't physical descendants of Jacob. Mm-hmm. So it starts off as a father to son thing and the father has to actually pass it on to the son to where the son automatically receives it and neither, even other people can receive it. So it, it, it broadens. And I think... I look at this as God's plan for bringing his covenant to eventually all mankind. And that's why I, I want to say, Jonah. Can I get an amen? I, <laughs> amen. Yes, I want to give Nehemiah, I want to give Nehemiah an amen because he tripped over a, a, you know, what we used to call a, when, we, when we used to have these little, what do we call those Nehemiah landmines? Mm-hmm. You know, the thing that's interesting about what Nehemiah just said and, and the question that you have, Jonah, and I want to give this as a picture, okay? So Jono, he could look at the details. He could get muddled down there in the mud. He could say, but was it deception and, and was it this? And did he really, you know, I mean, Jono's asking very practical questions. Request- and the issues of human affairs, okay? Mm-hmm. Now, Kenya, you're answering a question in terms of what Scripture said. What I want to say is this. I see, smell, feel, touch, hear the creator of the universe who told Abram, come from your land. Come on. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the come blessing. On. And so that Woo. even when, before these babies are born, he goes to the mama and says, look, mama, yes, there are two nations Preach in it. your womb and they're wrestling. And guess what? The younger is going to be greater than the older. Yes. So mm-hmm. how it came about yes. that in the end, the blessing came. Yes. And this is what happens in life. What happens in life is sometimes we can get tripped up on what's happening on the earth and human affairs. But when God's purpose is his purpose, in the end, his purpose is going to be fulfilled. Amen. So he tells Abraham. I'm going to bring forth a seed. 20 years of waiting for the barren woman. 20 years before she has the children. Then the two children come. I don't want to preach. But when the two children come, God says, hey, let me give you a secret real quick. Just so you know, the younger is going to deal the older. So when she hears the dad say, older one, go out and hunt, she mm-hmm. steps in. She's trying to be obedient. God said it's going to be the younger. And we could focus on those actions or we could focus on the promise. And the promise is the promise today. That's what I've loved about this whole co- you know, collaboration that we're doing. We're taking these different backgrounds and we're saying, you know, there still is a promise. And that promise came out of the mouth of Yehovah to a human person. And we get to live that today. That's mm-hmm. all I have to say. I know it's almost at the end. That's what I get so excited about when we do this, is that we keep smelling, feeling, tasting, hearing, seeing the hand of Yehovah in human affairs. Amen. He's maestro. Woo! Amen. <laughs> 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 Okay. So we are, we're rapidly running out of time, but, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's very clear by verse 34 that Esau had absolutely no intention of honoring the, uh, the giving over of his birthright because he's bitterly right. disappointed. I mean, he's, he's crying and exceedingly, uh, bitter and, and, uh, about the whole thing. And he pleads with his father to bless him. And as you pointed out, Nehemiah, he does bless him with a similar kind of blessing. And it's interesting the way that it ends. He says, and you shall, by your sword, you shall live. And you shall serve your brother, and it shall come to pass when you become restless that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now, shall we jump now? I'm thinking of jumping for the sake of time right to uh, 28 verse 3 and 4. But is there anything else, Nehemiah, that you want to pull out of this before we go? Well, one last point, which is that um, in that blessing to Esau in verse 39, there's one other difference with the blessing Mm -hmm. of uh, Jacob, which is that uh, he starts off in verse 27. He speaks about the field which Jehovah has blessed, and then it says, Yeho- and then it says, God, Elohim will give you from the dew of the heavens and the fat of the earth. Mm-hmm. And in verse thirty-nine, it's almost as just Isaac gives it to him, not Jehovah. Jehovah, God isn't mentioned anywhere. Sure, those words are missing. Behold, your yeah. dwellings should be of the fatness of the earth. He's and- like, okay, you want you want a blessing from me? I'll give you a blessing, but it's not the blessing from Jehovah. 
That I already oh. gave to your brother. Here we go. This is it. This is uh, uh, in in closing, my friends. Twenty eight verses three and four, because I think this is beautiful, and I love reading it out every time it's mentioned in Scripture. May and this is when, uh, uh, of course, Isaac is blessing Jacob just before he leaves to go to Laban. We're going to be reading about that next, because obviously uh, Esau wants to kill him because of what has happened. And before he goes, he blesses him. He says, "May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples and." And give you the blessing of Abraham to you and your descendants with you that you may inherit the land in which you are a stranger which God gave to Abraham off he went Amen. 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 There it is. All right, my friends. Thank you so much, uh, Keith Johnson, Nehemia Gordon, for coming back on to Pearls from the Torah Push. Be blessed, be set apart by the truth of the Father's Word. Shalom. You have been listening to the original Torah Pearls with Nehemia Gordon, Keith Johnson, and Jono Vandor. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's ministry, Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.